didn't want it to fall behind on my watch, so I appreciate everybody grabbing a seat. My name is Chris Beckering. Uh, I'm the Director of Business Development for Pioneer Construction. Pioneer is proud to be a sponsor of the Greentown event here today, and uh, it's my honor and pri privilege to introduce your moderator for this session, Aris Alabasic. He is the Director for the City of Grand Rapids Office of Energy and Sustainability. Uh, very interesting guy. He is, I believe, a Grand Valley alum, so a proud one, fellow alum, I should say, uh, here at Grand Valley today, uh, and a man of many hats. He has a leadership position with the Community Sustainability Partners uh, Partnership in addition to his work with the city, where he also handles uh, legislative affairs relating to energy concerns. Uh, two excellent panelists today, including Amy Butler, the Director for the Bureau of Energy Systems at the Michigan Department of Energy, Labor, and Economic Growth. She has more than 30 years' experience in developing and administrator, administering environmental protection and energy efficiency programs with the state of Michigan. And John Eberly from Fishbeck, Thompson, Carr, and Huber. He's a professional engineer and senior electrical engineer with extensive experience throughout the Grand Rapids and West Michigan area, including over 25 years in engineering design and project management for commercial and institutional facilities. It's my pleasure to introduce this session. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Thank you. I'll just briefly, uh, by way of introduction, uh, give you a sense of what, what's coming up in the next uh, hour or less than an hour. Uh, we went through an extensive energy efficiency strategy uh, process last year in November, and uh, we came up with some uh, remarkable results and a great document that uh, um, took a lot of efforts from different members of our um, city team from different departments, uh, but we couldn't have done it without the uh, um, great partnership we had with our uh, friends from uh, Fishbeck uh, Company. And uh, John Eberly is here to talk about the whole process, the results, and some of the challenges and some of the future work that's related to the energy efficiency strategy. Um, we also, uh, we're blessed to have uh, with us uh, Amy Butler from uh, Bureau of Energy Systems uh, in Mich at Michigan Department of Energy, Labor, and Economic Growth. Uh, she's the director then. I have had privilege uh, to work with Amy on many projects, including the last one, um, where the city of Grand Rapids came together in partnership with DLAG and some other organizations. and. Uh, we were successful in getting a significant amount of money for the community to do some neighborhood-related energy efficiency retrofit program uh, through what we call now Better Buildings Program. So um, it's a privilege and honor to be with these two uh, speakers today, and uh, I hope you're going to uh, gain, and I'm sure you will gain, valuable knowledge from both of them. So please uh, welcome them again uh, to our city. Well, it's good to see all of you here. Uh, Amy was gracious and allowed me to go first. And uh, that may be merciful for you because you won't have the boring part at the second half. So, um, I have to admit, I'm an engineer, so my presentation is heavy on words and short on pictures. So I'll wave my hands a lot. I'll try to keep you awake. But anyway, um, is there a remote here? We're here to talk about the uh, energy efficiency and conservation strategy that the city has established. Let's see. There it is. Um, and very simply, why they do it, how they do it, and what are the results. So the why is the easiest question to answer if you know anything about the city of Grand Rapids. We have just a few, a very few of the touchstones of sustainability the city has experienced. I, I looked around a little bit. I had a four-page document that was just the outline of the sustainability efforts that the city's gone through. But some of the ones that are, are more germane to this effort are up on the board. The, the 2006 uh, vision statement, um, the, the fact that the city's been recognized as having the most LEED certified buildings per capita, or most square footage of LEED certified building per capita in the country. Um, recent uh, recognition as the most sustainable mid-sized city 
this is all a tribute to city, um, the mayor, the staff, the departments, the engineering department, as well as people in the community, philanthropists, business leaders. This is a very, very exemplary community as far as sustainability goes. And they were offered an opportunity that pretty much every community had of a certain size, and they elected to take advantage of it and maximize it. And that was part of the alphabet soup. Um, EECBG, EECS, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. There was a bunch of these things floating around last year. This is part of the recovery effort that came through Congress. The Energy Efficiency Conservation Block Grant Program is a program that exists, it persists. In 2009, the federal government moved a much larger volume of money through that program. And the idea was to stimulate economic recovery, to reduce energy consumption, to create jobs, all of the things the stimulus was supposed to do. And in many ways has accomplished parts of that. What it did in Grand Rapids case was fund the situation that I think Norm Christopher was talking about in O&E. We was told to develop a sustainability plan Nobody wrote a check. Well, this was an opportunity where the city had some money, and they were told it was all carrot. There was no real stick in this. Develop a strategy on how you'd like to save energy. Well, they, they did this. And they did what the bare minimum was, which was to determine how they could save energy in their own facilities. Then they went on to an optional level, a tier two strategy, which inco incorporated the whole community and, and they used that money in that grant to do not just the bare minimum, but to find a way to kickstart something bigger than maybe they had to do. And, and we were really happy to be part of that process. It was uh, a lot of work in a short time. Uh, the deadlines on this program were pretty rapid, and uh, it was a very intense effort. But we had the input of, I would say, numbers of people in the hundreds, counting the staff that we had, but also counting many, many people in the city departments, the commissioners. I mean, we had just <laughs> a lot of focus for about a month on this. And we're real happy with the result, which was the energy efficiency conservation strategy. I mentioned the two, the two tiers. It, this is the first step in participating in that grant program. So going into tier one, the starting point for that was that um, you know, you walk into the city of Grand Rapids and you want to save energy. So you have to start to evaluate what's there and what you're going to do about it. 275 um, city-owned buildings. Um, street light distribution was really interesting. We started looking at some of the meters and some of the, the energy information, you know, that you're always trying to sort out. 15% of the energy in the city is street lights. That's a lot of energy for street lights. Maybe we could save some money there. I'll tell you more about that later. Um, the, some of the structures were really interesting when we were trying to gather the data. In the city of Grand Rapids, every department receives their own energy bills. The managers in the departments look them over, approve them, and they get sent to accounting to be paid. So that means if we're going to truly manage energy, we have to have managers in every department who understand all of the issues. That's kind of challenging. And so there's some recommendations in the strategy that help address that over the long term. Um, and then the fleet. Um, there's a lot of vehicles in this, this city. Um, I think if, when we added up the fuel used by city vehicles, it was nearly 3 quarters of a million gallons of diesel and gasoline over a year. So finding ways to manage that, I mean, that's 15% of the energy used by the city-owned staff and, and properties and so on. So anyway, the tier one was we used a hard numbers approach. This is going to be different for the Tier 2 analysis. Tier 1, city-owned facilities, city-owned fleet. We can find out what we used in a baseline year for energy. And we did. It wasn't always easy. Some of the sources are challenging. I mean, we talked about that earlier. Um, utilities don't always keep records on their past sales. I mean, once the bill's paid, they're happy. And so their, their process for managing that data is basically don't accidentally disclose it to the wrong people. And you have to convince them you're the right people, and you have to find the data. Um, so that was, that was really a significant part of the effort. There were, I think, somewhere around 140, 150 electric meters in the city. 
that the, that the city pays the bills on, something in that same range for gas meters. The, the city also uses uh, steam from a, formerly a county system. There's, there's a private utility that provides steam for heating in the, in the city. So all of those sources had to be looked at, dug through. Um, so that was the first step, was to sort out where is the energy be, being used. Then we spent time with the city to identify the strategic actions they wanted to take based on that information we'd gathered, and then to implement the plans for saving energy in the city facilities. Oops, I'm sorry. So this is the baseline. Now, one of the issues, um, if you look at the mayor's climate change um, uh, agreement that the city is a signatory to, they really want to use 1990 as a baseline year for greenhouse gas reductions. That's what they want to compare to. Um, for the kind of analysis we were doing, we really wanted hard numbers that we could count on, we could really be sure of, and they just were not available that far back. So working with the city, we, we chose 2008 as a baseline year for this effort. Now, that doesn't mean you can't find other ways to get back to 1990, but for this particular effort, for the specific um, strategy they wanted to develop, this was a better way to get to a solid, defendable number. And you can see there um, some very large numbers for energy consumption. These are directly related to the high quality of service that, that the city offers. All of the many things that the citizens count on are represented by these numbers. Um, and, and this is all energy spent in a good purpose. The, the challenge is to keep delivering the services and make these numbers smaller. This is what we found, um, and that there's a couple of things I wanted to point out in here. When you look at this pie, it's cut in some funny slices. I mentioned uh, street lighting and traffic signals, 15% of the energy in the city. One of the unique things about the city of Grand Rapids is, as a, an entity that's been here for 160 years, they've been delivering energy since anybody had energy to deliver. And at one point in time, it was really efficient to serve all of the streetlights as well as a lot of the city-owned buildings from one circuit. And that still persists. So in other words, there's a meter where consumers sells energy to the city, then the city has their own distribution network. So this is another layer of trying to get real data on all of those facilities because they may or may not be submetered. They may or may not even be identified. So you have this 15% of your energy, that's a big question mark. Um, in the time we had, we did a lot of effort to sort that out. We made recommendations. The city has got plans to make a different approach to that over the long term. But, but these are the things you discover. And one of the things that's really interesting is, you know, the community changes while some of the structures stay the same. Um, we'll talk more about that in a minute. The other two big pieces of the pie up there Environmental services and water. It's a very, very large part of what the energy is that the city pays for is used for those two purposes. Well, if you think about it, those are not city-owned facilities in the sense of offices and bus garages and things like that. Those are utilities that serve the entire community. Now, they fall under the control of the city, but you can't approach energy saving in those areas the way that you would approach it in an office building got a much different, you're, you're dealing with the utility at that point. And communities are different. These are the things you find out when you really start digging into what are the services, what are the departments. So the strategic actions to respond to those things, um, there were some fairly specific things that we knew going in we were going to be considering. And some of the things that, that we responded to and developed were discovered along the way. These strategic actions are fairly general if you read them. But, but what's really behind them, the idea of measurement and verification, that whole street light circuit where we don't really know where the energy is going, um, that's something we want to solve. The idea that we have to track energy savings in buildings as we improve them. So there's a recommendation that cities taking action on to add a measurement and verification piece to as they move forward to document the improvements they see. So there's an infrastructure that will be built that's independent of the utility metering system that will give the city the ability to 
gather this information to manage it, to make it available internally as they need to, rather than count on a consultant coming along at some point and digging through all the old power bills. It's information that exists. It's a tragedy when it disappears. So they're going to do something about that. Um, the idea of energy reduction collaboration. You have, as I said, a situation where you've got all these departments that are responsible for budgets, but they are, they're managed by firefighters, fire chiefs, policemen. You know, they, they know a great deal about how to operate their departments. They understand how to get the bills paid. But when it comes to time to make improvements, they really have to liaise with the engineering department. They have to get sort of above and beyond their own department. And there's nobody tasked, at least up until the start of the study, to really manage that energy piece. So one of the recommendations the city is, is looking at is to add a management function over that. I mean, if you look back in the energy numbers we had, I think that, I don't know, it's in the tens of millions of dollars that you spend on energy a year. Now that's an amount, amount of money that's worth having somebody manage as a professional. So that's a recommendation going forward. Um, energy conservation measures. Now this is really, this is the basis. This is the big carrot. This is why people did these strategies. This is why people approached this. The city had about a million eight or a million nine in grant that they were allowed to spend with a fair amount of discretion on whatever they wanted to spend it on that met the goals of the grant program. So they, they chose to do a, an energy audit, evaluate the buildings, and prioritize and choose some projects to reduce the general fund that they are spending on energy. There were other ways they could have done things with some of that money, but in order to get the best impact in the long run and do the take the most pressure off the city budget, that was really the right thing to do. So that's the approach that was taken. And we'll talk more about those specific uh, energy conservation measures in a minute. And then the fleet energy con um, consumption improvement, that was a, an effort to identify opportunities for, for reducing idle time for more efficient vehicles and so on. Um, am I taking too much time? I can step it up a little bit. Tier one, the overall energy conservation measure effort, we identified 198 projects. This was a whole bunch of stuff that you could do. It wasn't everything you could possibly do in the city to save energy. It was things that might fit into the paradigm of the grant. When we evaluated it, it was a lot more money than the grant. And if you look at that payback number, $400,000 savings for $10 million investment doesn't seem like a great idea. So obviously, some of these things got weeded out. Some of them got put on a list to look at later. Um, the actual projects that were undertaken, there were two groups. Group one uh, was about a $90,000 investment with a very high payback, $50,000 a year payback. The city elected to do this. They elected to fund this without expending any of their grant money on it because the payback was so quick that they could have a cash flow within a year, and they wouldn't have to report on all of these small projects for two and a half years after they were finished. What they did choose was a million eight in, in actual construction work that they're undertaking now. That has a savings of about $110,000 a year. And you might look at that and say, well, that's not a very good payback. But this is a, a very unique opportunity. Well, we generally look at energy investments in terms of return on investment. There's really no penalty for using this for something that pays back over a longer period of time. And it's just real, really an opportunity to deal with some things that you might never be able to fund. You know, there's some projects on the list that, you know, I, I might say, well, I could have saved more energy than that. Well, maybe I could have, but that still would never have enabled some of the larger projects to happen. So, so the tier two, this is community wide. This is a little bit different approach. Um, as I said, the city's been around 160 years. There's a few statistics about that. Known as the furniture city. This is not in the same sense as the other study, a hard numbers approach. This is an estimate of the greenhouse gas, and by extension from that, the energy consumed in the community. That's, that's how we approach this. And we actually used Ickley's, um, I'm not sure which of the products we used, but we used their approach. Yeah, CACP. So that, that's what we used. I guess it's right up there, isn't it? Broken into those six areas. Had its own challenges, data, data security, data certainty. Um, so 
lots of sources for data. And some of the transportation opportunities weren't very good. Homeland Security doesn't want to tell you how many trains go through a community. There's some things like that that, that are tough nuts. So you, you will end up making some estimates on some of these things. Um, continuing on, utilities, assessor's office, uh, the, the air permits from the state. There's a whole host of opportunities to gather data for this to try and fill in where all of the energy and greenhouse gas generation is happening. But this is very important. You have to address the uncertainty of your data. You have to identify the gaps. You have to find where you're making estimates. You have to be very clear about that. Somebody's going to come along later and use this product, and they need to know exactly what they can rely on 100% and where they might want to dig a little more. So that's part of the project. Here's a, here's a little bit of a, a shock, a surprise, if you look at some of the categories here. Um, transportation is the biggest source of energy consumption and greenhouse gas in this community, in the city boundaries of Grand Rapids, it dwarfs everything else. And we look at the furniture city, we look at the industrial sector, it's just about negligible. That's, that's, that's a real paradigm change, but when you think about it, there are condos in most of the furniture factories. We're a different community than we were 50 years ago. So th this, this gives you an opportunity to sort of look at what's really there in a new way. And you have to do it in a data-based way. The folks we got to do this um, make their living satisfying the federal government on air permits. And they don't guess on stuff. And you have to have that approach. Otherwise, you're going to be probably validating some ideas you had about this community or city. You really have to dig in and get to the source information and, and you know, make sure you're, you're getting the right answer. So the strategic actions here are maybe a little more general. Um, I won't go into them in any great detail if you'd like. The city's been gracious enough to put their entire plan on their website. You can read it. and um, I've read it again. And uh, I'm still satisfied that, that they're headed in the right direction. All of these things relate to steps that they're still taking. They're moving ahead with these things. So the lessons learned. This, that communities change more often than institutions. I think, I think it's, it's worth investigating. It's worth looking at your city structure, your county structure, see if it's still really what you're doing is responding to what the community needs. Um, once you get the information, it really will power improvements. It, it, if, you, if you really know what's going on, you can make changes. Um, the good data is absolutely worthwhile. And we found here and other communities where we've done this work that there's an awful lot of goodwill. There's an awful lot of really good practice already in place. And there are people that will do anything they can to help the city succeed. And uh, that's, that's comforting when you get into the middle of this fray and you're worried if, if you're going to finish or not. So lots of energy savings opportunities are available. There are more beyond this that the city will discover as they move ahead. And every community is unique. You can't really take this and apply it to every other city. But it's worth going through the effort for whatever community you're from. So thank you. Amy Butler. Go ahead. Thank you, John. How's that for sound? Am I turned on? Um, test, test, hello? Is that better? Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, good afternoon, and thank you very much for the opportunity to be here for a few minutes with you today. Um, my name's Amy Butler, as you heard. I'm the director of the Bureau of Energy Systems. How many have read Hot, Flat, and Crowded? And then you'll understand the Bureau of Energy Systems versus the State Energy Office, encouraging us to think as energy as a system not just the building, not just the city, but as a system overall. Um, I want to take about 15 minutes, I think that's what I've got, uh, and take you on a journey. My goal is, at the end of this journey, or in 15 minutes, how many people have read Malcolm Gladwell's The Tipping Point? My goal is, in 15 minutes, to have you uh, evaluating whether we are at the tipping point and what you can do to help take us beyond. Now, to begin any journey, you have to start somewhere. The first place we're going to start is how to move the slide. 
Ta-da! <laughs> okay, so some of you that were here yesterday uh, heard The Economist that talked quite a bit about some of the data behind uh, doing uh, a strong energy policy and strong energy programs in Michigan. Uh, the previous panel talked a lot about climate change. And one of the common threads you heard is it still makes good business sense. It still get, makes good economic sense. It still contributes to the bottom, triple bottom line, whether you believe in climate change or not. So we don't even have to get into that argument to some degree uh, to talk about strong energy policy and sustainability. Although measuring your greenhouse gas will help us to be more robust in those programs. But starting just from the beginning, uh, yesterday, the speaker that talked about the loss of the money that Michigan exports annually just to buy energy, he described it as one dump truck full of gold leaves Michigan every week. Just imagine what it does to your local economy if you can take one piece of that gold out of that dump truck. What about if you can take two pieces of that gold out of that dump truck? What kind of impact would it have on our economy if we could keep one dump truck here? We don't have to tackle the world in one day, but we have to start taking those pieces of gold out of that dump truck one piece at a time. And together, we'll be able to make that impact. Michigan exports over $20, million, $20 billion a year we give to other states, other countries. And some people describe it countries that don't even like us. We import 100% of our coal, 99% of our oil, and 70% of our natural gas. Just think what that can do to our economy. That is a huge economic drain on our state. Ta -da, I think I figured this out. Now take that down to the individual level. In 2002, the average household spent about $3,000 on energy it balances out about half and half, half, half for transportation and half for home use. By 2006, that amount had increased already to 4,600, or almost a 50% increase, or $1,600 taken out of every household's annual disposable income. Well, you, I don't know about you, but when you take 1,600 out of my budget, I don't go to the store and buy clothes. I don't necessarily go out to eat as often. And I don't necessarily contribute back to my local economy as much as I would. So why energy efficiency? We talked about just, and it's important when you're talking about energy, uh, quite often you hear, OK, renewables, all right, wind, energy, wind, wind, solar, uh, biomass, geothermal, OK. Those are the kind of the sexy pieces of energy. But what makes good economic sense to start with? Would you put a set of solar panels on a business paying the money that you need to to install that renewable energy and not optimize that building first, not insulate it, not put an energy efficient HVAC system in it? What would be the impact? The impact would be you would be paying ex the price for putting solar panels on a roof that you don't need. It's the same as throwing a few dollars out the window of your car as you're driving down the highway. I don't know about you, but I want to keep those dollars in my pocket. So just investing in net positive value measures alone could reduce U.S. residential energy consumption by 3.2 quadrillion BTUs. And for comparison, it's an order of magnitude of 200 coal-fired plants in one year. So you want to talk about the bottom line and where we start on our journey. You can look at it as, this is really depressing, this is terrible. Or you can look at it as, we have an insurmountable opportunity here, and we have everyone here ready to capture that opportunity. So what is Michigan doing in this area? And that's what I want to talk a little bit about today. I want to get you just excited to see that just in the last two years, because of some resources and some policies and programs that have been made available to us, that together we're making progress. We're starting up that mountain. We're starting towards that tipping point. 
The statute, the two, uh, energy optimization of the uh, clean energy statute that was passed in 2008, Public Act 295, that's the first energy legislation that we have had. That's our first renewable portfolio standard. Yes, meager, but it's a start. And it did a couple interesting things. It did include energy efficiency targets. Not all of the initial RPS statutes did. It also has a component in it that if the companies that are meeting their energy optimization targets are using Michigan-made product, it gives them extra credit. I'm not sure any other state did that, but that's a reflection on the fact that Michigan is strong in manufacturing. That's what we know how to do. We know research, we know development, we know how to provide advanced solutions to these ch challenges. We can figure it out and we can make it, we can build it, and we can build it better, faster, and quicker than China. We just have to put our minds back into that mode and do that. So that was one of the steps towards helping rebuild our manufacturing component. Another opportunity that came about is Recovery Act, American Reinvestment and Recovery Act. Now, how did that impact energy for Michigan? Well, if you put the weatherization program, I have one, one line I'd like to do. Okay, what does WAP, SEP, A, E, E, CBG, B, B, F, M, and S, E, E, A, R, P spell? It spells $439 million for Michigan for energy efficiency and renewable energy. That includes just the recovery money. That does not include the leveraging of that money. The $30 million Better, Business, uh, Better Buildings for Michigan project, we have $30 million in federal money, but we have to leverage that five to one. That's $180 million that's been put, being put into uh, researching and implementing residential energy retrofits. And testing a new model, testing the neighborhood suites portion, we'll get into that a little bit in just a little bit more. For, uh, $243 million in the weatherization assistance program. And, and a number of others we'll touch on in just a minute. We also invested in the development of a program called Michigan Saves. We, we uh, provided a grant, did an RFP, provided a grant, and developed this uh, unsecured financing framework which will be launched full scale in Michigan in just a few weeks, uh, where they pull together different uh, credit unions, uh, CDFAs. Um, I'm not sure if we got banks signed up yet, but they have a common instrument, so they're able to provide an unsecured loan to many homeowners that want to do deep energy retrofits of their homes. Uh, they will have a commercial aspect as well, uh, and we'll be developing that over the future. Also from a policy perspective and a regulatory perspective, in order for us to qualify for some of the state energy program money, we had to commit to try, uh, upgrading our energy codes. And those are scheduled to be promulgated. I think that they'll be official in January of 2011. And along with that, we're also, we have a compliance schedule and compliance training that we'll have to be, that we will be implementing along with the codes. So it's not just about putting the codes out there, but it's about teaching the assessors how to evaluate the codes, but it's also about teaching the operators of the buildings, now that you have those energy efficient mechanisms, how do we operate that building effectively? So those are some of the other programs that we have the opportunity. And we've already touched on just a couple of these already, and I'm not gonna have enough time to go through all of these, but I, I know that you'll have this PowerPoint available, and I hope what you'll do is go to our website michigan.gov forward slash energy office. Very easy to remember on purpose because there might be one of these programs that's right for you or there may be several of these programs that's right for you and that is really ultimately where we end up. It's not gonna be one program that fixes it all. It's not gonna be one city's sustainability plan that fixes it all. But it's gonna be how do you as your unique community take advantage of the tools and the programs that we put out there, and then achieve your goals and what's right for your community. One of the programs that we got, uh, we've been running for a number of years, the state energy program, the recovery funds, uh, usually it runs about a million to a million and a half a year. 
Uh, Robert Jackson is with me today, uh, who is our program manager for this program. And with the Recovery Act, we were able to get an $82 million. And we had an opportunity to do some very innovative things with, those pro with that program. And you'll see here that we really looked strategically at Michigan. And you remember I just talked about that manufacturing piece? We recognize that, that we can build it better. We can build these things bigger. We can build them faster. And we can find advanced solutions. And we have invested over $30 million in grants and loans to Michigan manufacturers to incentivize them in building the next generation wind towers or next generation hub or building the next generation commercial uh, energy efficient window. Polar Seal in Grand Rapids was one of those recipients. Uh, in my next session, Energetics, it was another one of those who took the, uh, their boat technology, making yachts, and applied it to making blades. Now that's an interesting transition. I can build a yacht and I can build a wind turbine blade. And I just saw today an interesting story about the Badger in Ludington bringing some of the wind parts over. Because when you, when you work with wind parts, they're very, very big. They're huge. They're monstrosities compared to what we're used to, uh, used to manufacturing. And it was interesting to, for me to see that because several years back, I worked with the Attorney General's office and we wrote the covenant not to sue that put that boat back into business. So seeing that happen today and seeing them being a transporter of alternative energy parts was very, very rewarding to me. But it was still bringing parts in. So my goal is to put those parts back on that boat and ship them out. Um, another thing that the DOE really asked us to do was think strategically with these funds and figure out how we could leverage them. They knew this was a one-shot deal. So how can you take these dollars and get more out of them? Don't just hand somebody a grant and be done with it. So you can see we created a revolving loan fund. We're doing some innovative things with that. One is supporting the advanced manufacturing, but another is also for state and public buildings. So communities early in, uh, early in October will have up to $5 million available in a low interest revolving loan that you can use to put towards your, uh, your retrofits of your buildings. We also have technology demonstration program that we've had for a number of years, but we were able to ramp up the size uh, and the energy audits that we make available for commercial businesses under 500 people. Again, the entrepreneurs are going to be our lifeline. They're part of our economic recovery. So we wanted to make sure that they're operating efficiently so they can be competitive glo globally. You've heard a couple people talk today about the university aspect and our technology demonstrations. Those grants are given out in concert with a business and a university. So you have to have both components. It builds that relationship. It also helps develop that business and gives them access to that university help that they need. I talked a little bit about the weatherization program already. Um, and I mentioned $243 million just from the recovery fund, which is the one on the left. But if you look at re uh, weatherization of residences, you'll see on the right, there's a number of additional programs. When you take all of the funds available through the weatherization program and all the pro funds available through the energy optimization, the low income home heating, the uh, low income energy efficiency fund, we have about $358 million going into weatherization over the course of three years in Michigan. And that does not include the retrofit ramp up or the better buildings for Michigan. Real quickly, our appliance rebate program. How many have had heard of the appliance rebate program? Has anybody here taken advantage of it? Good. I need your names. <laughs> well, the, the interesting thing about the appliance rebate program is every state got, got money to run an appliance rebate program, and they could design it the way they w wanted to. And there was quite a diversity in the way that the strategies were put together. But Michigan, because we had just passed Public Act 295, 
And we knew that the, the utilities were kicking off their appliance rebates as part of their EO plans at the same time. We didn't want to be in conflict with them. So we sat down, we met with them. We said, OK, what are you doing? What would be helpful that we could do? We sat down with the trade allies. What do you want to sell? And we talked to the uh, Whirlpool Manufacturing. What do you build? So we took all those things together into account when we put our strategy. We didn't set our uh, rebates really high, but we included a number of different kinds of appliances. And the reason we wanted to maximize the opportunity for Michigan residents to take advantage of the program. And we wanted to maximize the diversity of fuels and the diversity of types. Our main goal was get people out there, get them looking at these different appliances, getting them understand what an Energy Star appliance was, what a Tier 2 appliance was, a Tier 3 appliance was, and to get the people selling the products to understand what they were. Because if we did our job right, when the appliance rebate money is gone, that salesman's going to keep trying to sell that Energy Star appliance because he's going to understand it. Well, some of the states put their rebates really high, and they sold them out in five hours and two days. And DOE was coming in and going, what's wrong with your program? You haven't spent all your money. I said, no, we're spending it according to our plan. But you've got to spend the money. I said, well, we're spending the money. Just be patient. Um, but we stuck to our plan. We added a couple on. So we are at the point now where it looks like we'll probably be out of money by the end of uh, the 1st of October, somewhere around the early October. So if you're going to get your appliance, go now. Uh, but the really exciting thing is we will have handed out over 120,000 rebates. Now, you heard consumers talk about they've touched 171,000 people at our 120,000 on. That's a lot. That's a lot of appliances in a year. And the trade allies, Sears, would fill the rebate form out for them and send it in. They're all excited. They have this down. They've been selling them now for nine months. They understand. If we did it in two days, it would have been done out the door and would have been over. But because of the strategy that we took, we have that we have that education, we have that level of experience. And now they are talking about, there has been some discussion about whether further funding would be available for a program. So I'm hoping that we've laid some positive groundwork that would influence federal spending policy that would result in Michigan being able to gain further financial advantages. And that has been our overall goal. Make Michigan successful in any way that we can so we can better capture additional funding opportunities and build more tools. I want to close with the EECBG, or the HEBGB program. <laughs> you had to learn your, you had to really learn your alphabet when you started speaking IRA. Uh, I'd only actually been in the position for about a month and a half uh, when they signed the Recovery Act, and then I had to speak. Not only did I have to learn energy, but I also had to learn IRA. So. Um, the Energy Efficiency Conservation Block Grant, you have heard about the Grand Rapids project. EECBG, if you'll allow me to use the acronym, um, is divided into two pieces by statute. Anything over a certain population is called an entitlement community, and that means that they get their grant directly from DOE. And then what's left comes through the State Energy Office or our Bureau of Energy Systems. And then we are obligated to obligate a minimum of 60% of that to the smaller communities or the non-entitlements. So that's the only difference between an entitlement and non-entitlement is basically your population and your five-page formula that it, they go through to calculate whether you fall into that category A or category B. So with our funding, we have flexibility, but we made the decision because of the way we were, had already decided to spend the state energy program money that we wanted to focus the EECBG on community. So we passed all except the small administrative funds we had to have to run the program through to communities in multipurpose grants. 
We awarded additional money for regional collaborations. We wanted to encourage multi-jurisdictional approaches. We had seven counties come in together. We had a township, city, and village, uh, township, city, and county come in together. We had two cities come in together. We had two cities from two different counties come in together, which I think is just amazing. And we had a great distribution across the whole state. The other thing we did is we targeted two million of that towards LED lighting. Now why? Because we have R&D people, we have manufacturers in Michigan that do LED. We also have the next generation. We have induction lighting developers and manufacturers in Michigan. So it's important for us to give the message that there's a pipeline of projects out there. This is an area that, that Michigan can really excel in. We can be the new Silicon Valley of advanced lighting solutions, and it worked. We got $9 million in applications for a $2 million award. In addition, a number of the multi-jurisdictional projects and a number of the entitlement communities are all doing different kinds of lighting solutions. So it's growing in industry at the same time that it's providing energy efficiency in Michigan. So where are we at now? Well, if you've heard much about the Recovery Act, you know that as soon as they got the money out, they were wanted us to spend it, uh, stimulus, stimulate the economy. Uh, so our goal, our target goals from DOE are to have 20% uh, of all of our funds expended by the end of this month. That's a challenge, but we're on target. If we all don't die between now and then, <laughs> But that means that our non-entitlements are spending money and they're making progress. We've had our first five or six already completed. Uh, when you drive down 96, if you look to your right just as you pass Brighton, Genoa Township just put up five Michigan um, vertical access wind towers and solar cells on their township hall. Uh, we've got a number that are completing performance contracts, a number that are doing lighting. Uh, we have a real diversity of projects that are happening. Here's a little bit of an idea. We have some wastewater treatment plant energy solutions being tested. We have some bike and pedestrian paths. Now, under EECBG, there's 14 different kinds of categories you can actually spend that money on. And each community needed to have a plan. And that's one of the reasons we created with the MML, the Green Communities Challenge. My goal is to touch every community in Michigan within three years so that they are aware of and start looking at how they use energy and what can they do as a community to be more sustainable. We knew we couldn't do it with just handing out grants, so we had to create tools like performance contracting, revolving loan funds, Michigan Saves, and Green Communities Challenge. We had to have sustainable programs out there that were gonna help them and help us in reaching them. So overall, we have an exciting level of commitment. We have um, over 10% of that initial 19 million spent. We're probably close to another 20 million in the state energy program. Uh, we have some funding opportunities still available at the community level, but we are capturing new opportunities every day. We were awarded another competitive grant yesterday uh, called the Competitive State Energy Program Money, which is going to be a commercial retrofit pilot. So I hope I've given you just a little bit of an, uh, excitement and things to rally around, and you'll have to tell me if you think that we're reaching the point of a tipping point. Thank you. Well, thank you, Amy and uh, John. I appreciate your coming here and uh, sharing with us your stories, and um, I think we are reaching tipping point. But uh, I want to provide a, f a few minutes for a question or two, if, you, if anyone has a question. Seventy-five or eighty percent of natural gas, or so forth. Uh, if if the goal of the state is to both reduce energy and to transition to more renewable resources, 
What does that say about the relationship that the state has with those energy companies that are profiting from the importation of that? And what potential conflicts, if any, do you see with sort of that, that change over time? because we cannot replace the infrastructure quickly enough for that to happen. And one of the interesting things about renewable energy, it's much easier to phase in renewable energy over time where you have increased use, because you can just, as you're adding on capacity, you're adding on the renewable energy. Michigan isn't in that mode. Michigan is actually in a stable or decreasing use. Makes it much more difficult, because you can't get enough renewable energy put together and then suddenly turn off a power plant. So it's going to be such a gradual transition. I think that we'll have that opportunity to work on that situation as it develops. Um, I certainly can't comment on the e global economics of whether we buy oil from Saudi Arabia or not. Um, but if you just look at the impacts or potential impacts of hurricanes and the impacts on the Gulf and how quickly we can lose access to some of those uh, resources from an, e an energy security perspective, we need to seriously look at how we can be more energy independent, even just from that perspective. So there's a number of different, uh, I think there's a number of different policies that will come into play as that happens over time. Greg, you had a question. Uh, <clears throat> Amy, are you, are you tracking the, the rebates in the sense of what was turned in and its, its usage level versus the efficiency ratings of the, what's being purchased so that you know what the savings has been achieved from the rebates? I don't believe that we're tracking the usage. We are tracking individuals. We know what was purchased. We know how many were purchased. We know by who they were by. But as far as calculated energy savings, it would be a calculated. It was not. It's not gone back and been verified by home, uh, by actually energy actual energy reduction. <coughs> Uh, the better buildings for Michigan will be looking at some of those issues, uh, you know, behavioral changes. Uh, also, there's a Build America grant that Michigan State University and Dow, uh, Dow have just collaborated on where they'll be looking at some of the behavior pieces. So there's a number of areas. Um, but with the, the, the speed and the time, we didn't have a methodology in, it in order to do that collection. Uh, we have one one, two questions. Go ahead. Uh, I had a question for John and for Harris um, regarding transportation. So I was wondering, you said that uh, transportation accounted for 55, 57% of the community impact in terms of GHG. And I was wondering what kind of, um, I, I don't know, maybe you can't answer this question, but what kind of like VMT assumptions there are behind there? I mean, that's, that's a, it seems like it could be a huge range of error there. And I'm just curious that's a great if you know what. You know, how that I was calculated? I don't know the uh, answer to that, but I can see the person who might be able to help you find that out. So we can talk about that <laughs> okay, a little we, bit later. We can talk I, later about we, that. We used, we used basically publicly available information. Okay. And if there were assumptions made, they're documented. So we, right. can, we can help you understand and that. Okay. Yeah, GIS is not. Cool. Um, and then Harris. Um, were there any, I'm curious if Grand Rapids implemented any um, transportation related improvements to address those issues? Well, we, as a result of the EECBG, we have not used any funding from EECBG, but they're a part of the recommendation in the energy efficiency strategy. Um, as part of our green Grand Rapids, obviously, we have a lot of recommendation there. Uh, complete streets is one of them, and transportation and um, street infrastructure is extremely important in the future planning. We had one more question. Thank you. Actually, I, I got the mic over here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, my question was about the benchmarking the buildings and getting the accurate uh, energy use for the facilities. You talked about the meters and submeters and how you, there was a plan to to do something to, to solve that. I was interested in that, what, what you're working on for that. Yeah, the, the concept, and, and it's being implemented now. The city's contracted with a, a consulting firm to actually implement that. The idea, the basic idea was a web-based data collection system that relied on distributed meters that would belong to the city, not to the utility. And those meters would report back to a central manageable, you know, data 
location in the city. And the idea was that there's a lot of, right now, the, the actual process of tracking the energy data is not in the city's hands until they get a bill. This way, that you can have, you can have a, a web-based meter that, that sits there and records the energy consumption, downloads automatically to a central place what your consumption's been. You can, you can work with that data building by building. Um, it's, it's a fairly uh, cost-effective way to gather that data. And um, if, I, if I may add, gathering data and measuring and uh, measuring performance data has been extremely important for us as part of our energy management strategy. Uh, only recently we were able to finally get our hands around what exactly uh, it is that we use in terms of kilowatt hours annually per different accounts. And it's really extremely helpful. Any city, any community, any organization that doesn't do that should be doing that. They should be tracking their usage because it re really helps with our uh, renewable energy planning and our energy efficiency goals that we have as part of the sustainability plan. It is very important and also uh, part of our U.S. Conference of Mer uh, Climate Protection Agreement. We have to measure our greenhouse gas emission and obviously energy, uh, all sorts of energy aspects has to be measured. And the, 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 the initial application that we recommended and I think that the city's decided to do is the buildings where they spend the money to improve the energy performance are the first places that these will be installed. We have one more question. And um, we have to wrap up. My question is probably for Amy. And do you know whether the state is looking both in your rebate program but also in the mandated utility programs um, in terms of appliance rebates and incentives for new construction, so manufacturing facilities that might be expanding or building new facilities or commercial or residential for that matter, um, you know, making those purchase decisions going forward. Right now, everything's very geared towards replacement, obviously, but mm -hmm. um, continuing that market transformation as they go to make expansions. The initial investment from the, uh, the recovery funds really focused on uh, retrofitting existing infrastructure. We had so much opportunity there that that certainly is our first opportunity to, to strive for. Uh, going down the road, whether there will be opportunities to spearhead new infrastructure will depend on whether we can make those funds roll over to the point that we can do that. Uh, but we've had so much, we've got so much opportunity that we still need to capture in the, uh, in the existing infrastructure. The other thing that will help guide us in the new infrastructure is codes uh, and making sure that the, those new, bu new buildings are built energy efficient to begin with. Um, we, didn't ha we don't have as much of an opportunity to do that with codes, certainly with existing retrofits. So most of our funding and most of our opportunity right now have been focused on transitioning existing manufacturers or retrofitting existing businesses, retrofitting existing homes replacing a, a initial appliances. Um, I know on the national level, uh, they've been talking about standards for appliances. Uh, and so new, you know, if we can get to that point where there's standard is standards and new appliances. There's also been discussion about smart appliances. It was interesting, I heard Whirlpool talk to us the other day about um, in actuality, to get to the smart appliance, they might have to lose a little bit of the efficiency because they, they, they've gotten the appliances to the level of efficiency that in order to get the smart, smart part incorporated, they may have a trade-off. It's, it's just real interesting to see where the science is going right now uh, and where that next generation happens. Well, hopefully, we've laid some firm framework and groundwork here that Michigan will be at, at the forefront for developing those advanced energy solutions. And that's been one of our big goals. Well, um, one more, but very quick. We have to. Could you say a few more things about how the energy plans to move in the next 10 years to 100% renewable Yeah, we're working. Uh, I think I would recommend highly our next renewable energy session if you're planning to stay here. Uh, we have three experts, uh, Daniel Nelly, Roger Rackup, Michael Ford. And also uh, our Arn Mozart, who's going to be moderating the session, and you can hear from them. We are looking at some different options and partnership opportunities. We've been working uh, very hard, um, and I'm more than certain that we're going to meet those goals. You're welcome. Yes, um, I want to thank again Amy and John, and please uh, give them a round of applause.